<laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Jackie Miller, and I'm the site manager here. And um, we're going to start off with Bob, because Bob is a scientist. And most of this research adventure is a historical adventure, but we know that Mound Lab was mostly science. So we need a good foundation for the chemistry and the process and why we have bismuth crystals here in the first place. So I'm going to ask Bob to come back up, and he is going to explain all the science stuff that I cannot. Thank you, Jackie. Got it. Okay, so now we're going to understand, try to get the story of showing, why did not, there. Now we go back one, right? Why did it go back? You're going forward. I know. That's what happens when you don't have a Mac. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. There's a quick way to go back. We'll start as a... There we are. It was a 219 row. Now we see it. All right. Okay. Good. Okay. Right there. Right there on that one. All right. Now we're good. We hope. Okay. So we're going to start. This is... The Manhattan Project in World War II developed the first nuclear weapons. And the photograph you see is the first detonation of an atomic bomb that took place uh, in Alvarado, uh, New Mexico on July the 16th, 1945. And it was called the Trinity device. And there were two uh, other devices, atomic bombs, that were used against Japan in World War II. One was Little Boy, which was Dr dropped on Hiroshima on August the 6th, 1945. It used a uranium-based device. And Fat Man, Nagasaki, on August the 9th, was a plutonium device. And these two uh, devices pretty much forced Japan to surrender and thus end World War II. Okay. There we go. Okay. So what are the devices, and what, why are we talking about bismuth? Well, this is a schematic of the uh, Trinity device and the Fat Boy uh, atomic bomb. This is the overview. Uh, what it did is it was a surrounding of a uranium-238, uh, plutonium-239, what would be this blue box, and then surrounded by chemical explosives. And in the very center was what's called the initiator, uh, the polonium beryllium. What this was, this is a schematic of that device, and it used the radioisotope polonium, uh, polonium 210, and the code name was urchin. And what polonium did is it, was a, it decayed by emitting an alpha particle. And that alpha particle, that it, and would collide with a beryllium uh, nucleus to uh, form carbon-12 and release a neutron. Because polonium had a very short half-life, uh, it would release a large bunch of them. So the operation of the device was that when they dropped a, a, a bomb, the uh, chemical explosive would compress inward, a spherical, onto the uranium, which would then compress the the plutonium to make it dense enough that it had the critical density to, to have fission. But this device here was generating the neutron that initiated it. It started in those first group, and then as fission occurred, more of it a bomb detonated. So this was the process, and it was a process used in most of the nuclear weapons up until the middle 50s. Technology evolved, and they did other things, but this was the Now, polonium-210 is a radioactive element, and it decays in the alpha particle to, to lead, as I said. The half-life is only 138 days, so it's very, very short. And because of that, it, it, it emits a, a, 
uh, its alpha particles very quickly. In fact, this is a photograph of little strips of polonium on platinum foils that it's ionizing the nitrogen gas around it, causing it to glow. All that from the energy released from the uh, uh, polonium and the helium atoms, and so it would just literally glow. Uh, now, polonium is a very rare element. It was discovered uh, in the end of the 19th century by the Curie, Marie and Pierre Curie, and it was discovered as a little amount in, in, in uh, uranium from a decay because it does occur that way. And in fact, to get this element to, to use in the atomic bomb, they started out at a project in Dayton, uh, a Monsanto project to, uh, as part of the Manhattan Project to separate it. But they found that it was inefficient. They couldn't get enough of the polonium necessary for the device. And one of the things that was uh, investigated was they knew that if they hit the el uh, element bismuth 209 with a neutron, it would absorb that neutron and then emit a gamma particle. Gamma, gamma, part gamma ray has no mass, so it's remained a, uh, an isotope of bismuth. But then the bismuth two, and became 210 uh, because it absorbed that mass of the neutron. It decays with a half-life of about five days by emitting a beta particle. Beta particle is equivalent to electron. So what had happened internally is you had a neutron in the nucleus of, of bismuth splitting apart into an electron that's emitted and then become a proton. And that changed it to a new element, the next element on the periodic table, polonium-210. Now polonium uh, has this very short half-life, as I mentioned, and therefore emits lots of neutrons in a short period of time. In fact, the, the, the standard counting for radioactivity is a curie, which is based on the radioactivity that one gram of radium has, pure radium metal. Uh, 0.24 milligrams of polonium-210 equals one gram. So 0.24 times a thousand smaller amount of, of polonium is equivalent to one gram of radium. That is an indication why it was considered a, a very uh, uh, efficient way to initiate nuclear weapons. And this process, there we are. So this is that reaction schematic. Uh, this is that uh, polonium-210 emitting that alpha particle, hitting the beryllium nucleus. It releases that neutron. That neutron then hits either uranium-235 or plutonium-238 nucleus, excites it, causes it to split that's the fission process, and it releases two to three neutrons each time it does that, depending on what, what the decay the products are. So it starts by hitting with one, releasing on the average two and a half. Next one hits though, and in a very short time, like in billions of seconds, you're now having tremendous amount of energy and fission reaction occurring. This uh, schematic shows a full-scale model that was assembled about 20 years ago on the critical device that shows in the very center a, a schematic of, of where the uh, polonium uh, beryllium urchin device was located. So now the process of getting all that that polonium that's needed is that because it's so rare, it had to be produced artificially with this was as I mentioned a few minutes ago. And what the process was to take high purity bismuth metal into slugs, seal them in can, and then put them into a reactor with neutron to form the bismuth uh, 210, and then as it decays in polonium. Now that you've irradiated for a period of time, you've made polonium, you then have to do the process of extracting it chemically, because there's a very small amount of polonium in a lot of bismuth. And so you would uh, dissolve it in nitric acid, remove that, denitrate it, scrub it, dissolve it again, uh, polonium in the bismuth, you reduce the uh, polonium, you dissolve it again in another uh, material that's a, a hydroxide, dissolve it, finally you convert a small amount into uh, uh, the metal that is, the, is actually collected and, and, and used. 
Now, just, just to put it in, in context, this is a periodic table which presumably everybody who had chemistry in high school saw, but you may have forgotten over the years. But, so here's hydrogen to number one, and you go all the way through to the highest element, which all, the, all these ones in yellow are radioactive. And here is bismuth. For, for a long time, bismuth was presumed to be the last isotope that was not radioactive. However, in 2003, it, dis it was discovered that it was radioactive, but it had a half-life of 10 to the 19th year. <laughs> the age of the universe is only uh, three to the 10 to the 10th years. So it all, all affected stable, but it does does decay. But and this is that conversion process of absorbing a a uh, neutron and becoming polonium. Bismuth also can absorb an alpha particle and become uh, actinium right there. So it can become another element. But this is the location and the properties uh, are determined. This is a series of the post-transition metals, semiconductor, heavy metal. Here's lead, which is just before. That's what bismuth decays into when it <coughs> goes there. But you'll notice that uh, the property of almost most of these elements, uh, thallium, lead, tellurium, they're, they're very toxic. Uh, bismuth's not, but it, you know, it's a, all right. So this is kind of that, that summary, as I mentioned, that uh, bismuth uh, can, uh, it does decay with this very long half-life into thallium and releases an alpha particle, helium-4 nucleus, that I said. But it also has other unusual properties for a metal. It's diamagnetic, that is, it's not ferromagnetic like iron or paramagnetic like, like uh, many other metals. And so it, it resists an outside magnetic field. And so it has certain properties it can use. It also has a, a fairly low melting temperature, and its liquid is more dense than the solid phase. So in essence, it's like water. If you melt it, the solid will float on it to a degree. And it also has a unique crystal structure uh, of, of cubic one, and because of its uh, density, it will grow, and that's what we're going to be talking a lot about, it, with thin surface oxide layers on the surface. And this low toxicity uh, for heavy metal gained a lot of popularity as, as replacing it for, for lead, because lead is toxic, as you would know. Now, polonium is still made with neutrons in a reactor, but currently only about 100 grams of polonium are made each year, and uh, small. so it's really research quantity, very specialized uh, uses for polonium. But in the 1940s in this side, they actually made polonium and put them in spark plugs for your car. A small bit, because it was so radioactive, it would decay, and the idea was that it would make your efficiency of your combustion engine hotter. It didn't work too well, and then all the polonium and the, and the uh, use of the, in the nuclear weapons industry kind of ended that. And again, because their half-life short, they would only last a few months, and then you know, you have to replace it. So maybe it was good to manufacture, but it wasn't. And we actually had downstairs uh, in the exhibit hall an example of one of those uh, spark plugs that have, was made with polonium. So if you walk out, you can find it back in the, in the display. So getting on. And the, the last uh, application is that bismuth is used in Pepto-Bismol. Remember, it's non-toxic. It uh, you know, prevents diarrhea. I'm sure pretty much all of us have had it. Probably our parents gave it to us when we were, were small. But there are used for other uh, uh, medicines. And it's actually the, the, been the major use of, of bismuth for, for many years. I got a, come on, there we go. 
Now this is a couple of images. This is what uh, bismuth, you can actually find examples in, of, of, of the metal. Uh, and these are a cube of it, uh, one cubic centimeter. It symbol is BI, and it has a, a, a simple electronic, electronic structure. Xenon is the inner structure, and this is, uh, matches the properties of the outer shell. The melting point is only 520 Fahrenheit, or 273, which is very low for a metal. And it was actually identified and discovered in the uh, 17th century, although it had been known since antiquity, but it wasn't very really chemically isolated. And it's a brittle metal with a dark hue, <coughs> and that's oxide, which we'll talk about. Density is 9.8 uh, grams per cubic centimeter, so it's fairly dense. It, it's much more dense than iron or and similar to what copper would be. Not, I don't think quite as dense as silver, but anyway. And again, it expands on freezing, so uh, it has very low thermal conductivity. Ah. Now, where did the color come from? And this is a photo, and you're actually going to see a lot more examples. It's this chunk metal, but on the surface, it oxidizes very, it forms a thin, transparent oxide in a different layer, and light strikes it, it gets reflected back. It gets reflected in combinations of color, and then because it, it, you grow the crystal, it tends to expand outward uh, by the growth pattern, this, and the variation of thickness will cause the, uh, different uh, colors to form or be observed. It hasn't changed and uh, again it is attributed to the fact that part of it is due to the fact that the crystals are lighter than the liquid so they have a tendency to, to grow and expand out in this pattern. So this has been my uh, kind of the orientation of the properties and now I'm going to turn it back over to Jackie to talk about the discovery that were made here at the museum in the last few months. Thanks, Bob. Um, so, I, we know that in 1972, Mount Laboratory gave a bismuth crystal to Boomshot Museum that was, at that point in time, called the Dayton Museum of Natural History. So, that was a fact that we knew. In September of 2021, before I was a site manager, I was a curatorial assistant here, and I came across these photos on the screen um, and only knew a couple of the guys there. Some of you might recognize some of the guys. There's, some, there's one in particular, I didn't know who it was. So I emailed Boonshoft and was like, can you help me identify this man? Is it just a random guy? Is he someone important? I need help. And um, they were going to look into it. But I did find out at that email that they still had their crystal, which I thought it was cool, but nothing came up with it then. In January of 2022 this year, I became the site manager, and then I was put in charge of fostering relationships between the Mount Cold War Discovery Center and the community, and I chose to try to foster relationships with other museums, including Boomshop. So I emailed again to see if maybe we could do something about this crystal. And then in March of 2022, after Bob had talked about um, lectures, I had told him that maybe we could make something out of this crystal thing I found out. So the main question before anything was, well, why did my lab give this business crystal to Boomshaft? We know they have it, but why? Um, this is their crystal on their online system, so it tells uh, where it is in their museum, where they got it, and a description of it. And this is a better picture. When I emailed back in September, it was on that shelf in the back workroom, and then they took a nicer picture for me. So now that we had it, we wanted to try to figure out why. So we looked in some old documentations, and we found this little blurb in a mound view from 1972 of Dick Plitcraft giving, um, what's his name, Joseph McHugh, who was a assistant director of Boonshaw, or the Natural History Center, um, 
a crystal, but it really doesn't say why, it just says to commemorate. But this little blurb also says that Mount Lab gave a crystal to the Smithsonian Museum as well. So we found that very interesting. This is documentation from Boonshaft about their crystal. This is, was given to them when the crystal was donated to them in 1972. And the first two pictures are just instructions. You know, they had a, the system, how they made it. They used 40 pounds of bismuth to grow this crystal. Um, and then it was Dick Flitcraft writing to the director of the museum at the time, thanking him for taking the crystal. Um, sorry he wasn't there, he had a great time, all that schmoozing that they would have done back then. Um, so in March, we decide that with this new information we dug up, it would make a good presentation, which is why you're all here now. Um, and then we found out that about the Smithsonian crystal on March 21st, and then a couple days later, I decided that I was actually going to email them um, the Smithsonian is like the crown jewel of museums, and I honestly didn't think that I would get a response. But the guy did email me rather quickly, and he sent me a picture of the Smithsonian's business crystal that Mountain Lab had given. Um, he told me that they purposely put it in two parts. Here's his email. So the specimen in question is in the rest reference collection when acquired in 1972 it was initially cataloged as a synthetic collection item which is what the top card represents they also sent us documentation um, the specimen itself has one of the business groups detached so there are now two separate specimens under their catalog number uh, and then it, he gives the dimensions um, I try to find this on their website with no luck, even with the actual catalog number. What popped up was a business specimen, but no picture, and it said they got it from South Africa, which is obviously not where Mount Lab was located, so um, we're not sure. And this was more documentation that they were given when Mount Lab gave the Smithsonian their business crystal. So now we have to ask, well, why did they give both of these museums a business crystal? What, what was that about? And my guess was that they were marking the end of the polonium work at Mount Lab, which ended in 1972. But we needed to research that. We can't, we can't know for sure. So we know, as Bob has stated, Bismuth was at the lab to get the polonium. And then we know, at some point, Mound started to just make the crystals into awards. But we don't really know what was in, in between there. And there are some examples of our bismuth crystals. You can see them in person in the back case as you leave. So now that we know like it was a thing, and we have our hypothesis that they did it to mark it, um, did it become a special project is what we were trying to find out. Was there just some guy who every Tuesday was making these awards? So we had to do more research. We looked at our business samples in the collections room and in the cases here for clues. And we had our lovely intern photograph these very nicely for us. And part of our research was to go into our photo collection. If you didn't know, we have over 100,000 photo negatives from 1945 to 2003 throughout Mountain Lab's history. And when we searched the database, these are some of the photos that hopped up for business while we were hunting for clues. So we have some crystals they made, the process of getting the polonium from the bismuth, the bismuth slugs, some diagrams and charts made for reports. Then we have some more photos of some other VIPs with the crystals. Uh, that middle picture is one of the earliest pictures we have. And then during the search, we came across the same mounders over and over and over again. 
So yeah. Flick Craft, Bill Tucker, Don Kelly, Dean Down, Jet Nelbron, Frank Ron and Deer, all these guys kept coming up and ladies came up over and over and over again in the research. Unfortunately, these people have passed, so we cannot ask them directly, why did you do that? Also in our research, we were looking all over the place, and one of the things that Bob wanted in this presentation was about crystal healing. Um, there are people that believe crystals will uh, make you more healthy or help you with your mental stress, and bismuth crystal, if you believe in that sort of study, is one of those things that will help with vitality and release feelings of isolation and loneliness. You kind of just leave them around your house and it's supposed to give you good vibes. We also found this guy. So if you have kids or grandkids, there's a cartoon out there with a character named Bismuth. He kind of looks like it. The little square in his chest mimics the squares of the Bismuth, and he's got the rainbow hair, like the rainbow colors. So after all our research, we decided that making the Bismuth crystals was both an official and unofficial job, and as Warren would say, a G job. So it was, someone told you to do it, but it, you weren't supposed to do it. It was kind of under the table and by the instruction or influence of someone high up who wanted to make a crystal for someone to denote some special anniversary or VIP visit. And so after all this research, we obviously decided that we needed to make a business crystal. Um, so on May 5th, we got some equipment to help us. On May 11th, we had our first crystal club meeting because so that's when we decided we were going to make a presentation. It was a go. We had enough information, um, and we were going to have a good time. On June 6th, the equipment came. It's that blue little box up there. And then on June 21st, all the supplies were here, and we were ready to go. So to make our bismuth crystals, we had our little oven, stainless steel appliances, the little tongs, the fork. Uh, we had heat safe gloves because as Bob said the melting point is 520 and that's really hot and then we had a little temperature gauge so we didn't have to get too close that's what we needed and then we filmed this process so that's what you're going to want
made us decide to go back to Boonjot and we're going to donate that little crystal at the end to them as well. So we went to go recreate the photos <laughs> of 72 versus 2022. They still have the tree cookie. So we took our picture in front of the tree cookie with our little crystal and tried to match their stances as best as possible. Um, the reflection pond by the dome no longer exists, so we just went in front of the dome for our recreation. And we were joined by Anna, who is going to be our third speaker of the night, and her boss, Jill. And there's a comparison of the one from 72 and our little guy that we made this year. And then with that, I would like to invite Anna Helmig up. She's a registrar at Boonshaw. Like Jackie said, I am the registrar for the Dayton Society of Natural History, which you probably know us by our museum's name, which is the Boonshoff Museum of Discovery. Um, but in 1972, when we received our lovely crystal from the mound, uh, we were known as Dayton Museum of Natural History. So there's lots of different names, bear with me, um, lots of Daytons and lots of like acronyms. Uh, but at that 
time, our director was a gentleman named E.J. Kessner. You can see him with a duck, um, or a duckling, on the grounds of the museum in the 70s. He had a pretty long tenure at the museum. He served from the mid-50s to the late 80s. And he actually moved in a lot of the same social and professional circles as some of the mounders, especially some of the more higher-ups. He was kind of um, a higher-up in Dayton society. Um, so some of the members might have knew, known EJ and they might have hung out or had professional meetings. On the right is just a picture of the museum at that time. We are a lot bigger now. Um, but at that time, we were more of a natural history museum. If any of you have visited Boonshop lately, you will know it is more of a children's museum right now, um, which is something we are trying to change. But our collection in the 70s was not quite as large as it is today. Um, so the bismuth crystal in the 70s was a really big deal for our mineral, mineralogy department in our geology collection. Um, the crystal was on display in EJ's office, which tells you how important it was to him. Um, and then after EJ retired, it came to live in the lab where we do a lot of our work. So currently, um, the crystal is at Boonshoff Museum. Um, we operate two sites. We operate Boonshoff and we operate Sunwatch Archaeological Village. So all of our collection is at Boonshoff. You'll see there that picture on the left is a picture of our geology vault. It is where the bismuth crystal would live. Um, there are all kinds of rocks and minerals in there. That's not really my thing. My background's in history, but they're beautiful rocks. Um, very pretty stuff. We curate approximately somewhere around 1.8 million objects. So our collection has grown quite a bit over the years. Um, and we collect in the fields of geology, astronomy, anthropology, and biology. But believe it or not, despite millions of objects, this bismuth crystal is still the only bismuth piece we have in the collection. So I think that kind of speaks to how special and important it still is to us. Um, the picture on the right is just a better picture of our crystal. I did bring it today, so if you're interested, you can take a look after our presentation. But the future of the crystal is really what I'd like to talk about because it's a really exciting future. Um, in a few weeks, the original crystal and the lovely new crystal that they have made for us will be on exhibit in our new um, Visa Room Wonders. So this new exhibit will highlight only the best, um, so the most beautiful, the most educationally valuable, the most important collections objects we have. Um, so we chose that crystal not only because it's really pretty, um, it has lots of rainbow <coughs> colors, it's a stunning piece, but it's also a really great representation of the Dayton area's really major impact on nuclear science. Um, we're going to include the story of the mound, which I think maybe people visiting Boonshoff might not know, um, and we're going to talk about why the crystals were created, um, all about the mound's history, that sort of thing. Now, unfortunately, um, we've only finished three out of four quadrants in the visa room. Um, of course, the crystals are going to be in the geology quadrant, but we finished um, every other quadrant. So I can't show you the exact um, display that the crystals will be in, but I did take a picture of the two finished quadrants we have, just to give you an idea of kind of the atmosphere and the exhibit they will be in. This is our anthropology quadrant and our astronomy quadrant. So if you've been to Boontroft, you know this is a very stark contrast from the rest of our museum. It's meant to be more of an adult space, so adults can enjoy collections, objects, and relative quiet, um, maybe learn something new. But I think the crystal will work really well in here because you can read about the story. Um, maybe you can have your kids plan the playground outside while you read the story of the crystal. Um, I think moving forward, hundreds and thousands of people who visit Boonshop every year are really going to admire the crystal and enjoy the rich history behind it. Uh, we were super excited to work with Jackie and everyone on the mound, and especially tracing the history of this awesome crystal, and we hope it's the start of many more collaborative projects, because really, if you think about it, um, we're both museums and our missions are super similar, and they're to educate and inform generations of Daytonians about not only science um, and STEM, but also the rich history um, that's in their own backyards. So with that, I think we are finished. But does anyone have any questions before we set you loose? Oh, we do have a question. Yes? Yes. So far we've seen little crystals. Mm -hmm. But is there a volume manufacturer of it used for medicine, or what is it used for? Um, good question. I'm going to invite Bob to <laughs> 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 Yeah, 
Okay. Actually, I don't think they grow crystal for medicine, other than those that believe in the, in the healing process of happy crystal. But they do process bismuth in all these dull chemical powder forms. So, it, but it is a hobby. If you go on the internet, you go on the YouTube, and you go, you know, you search for bismuth. There's all kinds of people that that do this and grow crystals and and. And, and then it will sell you some. So it's a kind of artsy market out there of, of science, but it, the crystals are not really made, you know, for use the way they are. They're just physically attractive, I, I think. And you can see for yourself, you know, the, the play of, of, of optics off of this relatively obscure, you know, a chunk of bismuth metal without oxygen on it, gray metal, chunk heavy metal. And, but because of the effect of a, of a transparent object and interference with light, that physics gives you color that we see. And the way it grows, it makes all these reflections. So, so is the powder ground up into something for any medical purposes or just? Well, the peptobismol. It is. Literally, it is. It is still in, in, in pep Now, they use some compound to make it more soluble. You know, it's not just the, a metal. It, it's made into a, a, a water-soluble compound, psilocyte or some. I mean, I'm a, I'm a chemist, but not a, one of those wet kind of chemists, do they? <laughs> so, yeah, yes. Yeah. Can you speak to anything of the way that the mound processed the bismuth that it purchased to purify it? I read there was some concern about uh, contaminants, contaminate, for instance. Uh, was there any extra refining done before this stuff was canned and shipped off to be irradiated? Uh, it was processed to be very, uh, you know, highly, highly purified. Because there were, there were specs, you had to not have other you know elements in there. Because literally the amount of polonium that was created is, is very small, and so you know, and, and they use a chemical treatment to extract the relative you know chemical properties of, of, of polonium versus bismuth. So if you had some other metal that could easily get carried along with the polonium, so there were very detailed specs. You know, and I'm sure they're documented. They're, you know, there's a the book. At one time, of course, this was classified. All that information was per pertained to preparing nuclear weapons material. Uh, and in fact, the first heat source that was invented at Mound used polonium and not the plutonium-238. It was that fact that it decayed quickly and released a lot of heat with the idea behind the making electricity from radioactive decay. So, you know, it, it's a convoluted thing. The business, I think someone said, oh, these are pretty, we can make a connection. And as Jackie said, it, you know, we never found the documentation. Said, yes, this was a plan, we're going to do this. It seemed to have happened. Whose idea it was? I don't know, lost, lost in there. Yes, there. When they started refining the business, how much did they start with? 100 pounds, 1,000 pounds? Yeah, 1,000 pounds or so. I mean, it was, Business was, you know, was a, com a, a commercial commodity, but they had a lot of processing to, to get down to the size of the ingot. The ingots that actually that they put in were maybe four to six inches and about an inch in diameter, a little left, sealed in an aluminum canister. And so you know, that, that's what they would, and it wasn't, you know, when you, if you melt it, you know, and then you cooled it, it would get smaller. I mean, well, actually, it would get bigger, but you leave, leave enough space for it to expand out, and then and it was always hot. And then they would—they didn't heat to dissolve it; they dissolved it away. But they were, you know, relatively small pellets. You can see the uh, uh, tubes. We have some <coughs> examples uh, down in our museum site to show a couple of examples of one. Whether there were other sizes, or I don't know. But, yes. When they made the crystals uh, in the backyard yeah. here. Did you keep remelting the same bismuth? There? Yes, we did. Yeah, we bought four pounds to use, and everything we didn't like, you saw a lot of oopsies. We just yeah. crunched up and put them back into the beaker and remelted them until we got something we wanted. Right. Yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. You showed about a dozen successive attempts to make them, and it looked like in the end you got something better. Can you say a little bit about what, what. Um, what you decided needed to be changed uh, as you went through the process to get better. 
I'm going to go on the microphone now. Yeah. You did have the, uh, you had the document that, uh, that accompanied the big crystal to uh, Dayton that you said described how those were made. Um, were you trying to follow that recipe or uh, tell us a little bit about this? So we went off of, because we did not have the equipment they had at Mount Lab, mm -hmm. and though Doug was very generous and let us borrow his little oven, that's not the same equipment that they used and we couldn't get that. If you go into Google and you search how to make crystals, they just have them on their stoves. Um, I've tried that, or I wanted to try that, and my boyfriend said, absolutely not, you can't make a business crystal in the house. So, where's the... Um, oh, it was in the movie, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so, we decided that we were gonna use a hot plate in the oven. The hot plate could not get hot enough, so we stuck with the oven. And if you watch the videos on Google, you take it, it out, and they'll form shapes on the top of the surface of the business. And the guys just grab it and pull out these giant, massive crystals. The people on the internet couldn't get the colors, but they got the crystal structures. At the beginning, we got the colors, but we couldn't get the crystal structures. So we determined that we were cooling the business too fast. So towards the end, we decided we were going to leave it in the oven, but turn the oven off and let it cool naturally and check on it every 10 to 15 minutes mm -hmm. to see if we could pull something out. And the big one we got, we waited 25 minutes and pulled. We saw a structure, but we determined it was at the bottom of the, the beaker instead of the top. So we dumped out the molten and he was in there and we cracked it out of there. That's what you were doing, it looks like. You were attempting, here's a test poll. Yeah, right. Don't like it yet. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, and the attempts, we, some days we remelted the business four or five times. Sometimes if there was rain, we could only do it once. The oven puts out an insane amount of heat, and it was 95 degrees, so we, we didn't want it in here. We wanted the museum to be the cool refuge that we could escape the heat, so we didn't do it inside. That's why we did it in the back. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Warren? Is there a slag component to this? In other words, it, I don't know what the efficiency is on the process. In other words, generally with metals you have a slag component. Correct. So the business we bought from somewhere near Toledo actually, you just buy it online. It cost us about $45 to get the four pounds. Um, it's, I think it says it's 99% pure bismuth. So before you pull the crystals, you have to skim off these little gray crusties from the top. Um, so the crystal we did made uh, has a little of the gray, and you can see it still on there, but it's because it grew on the side of the <coughs> container. And as we were cracking it, the crusties got on the outside. From your experience, and knowing the size of crystals that were grown by Gene and others, I reckon, how much bismuth that you have to start with based on what you've learned? Um, in the documentation they gave the uh, Boone Shop, they said it was their crystal was grown in 40 pounds of bismuth. I cannot afford 40 pounds <laughs> of bismuth. So we stuck with four and we got an okay size crystal I think for four pounds. Um, but there's no way I could get 40 pounds I mean, on the company. I mean, this is unfunded <laughs> research, right? I mean, this, this was, <laughs> literally literally almost per pound or whatever that you bought. What's what is, what's the cost of it? I think all four pounds because I bought one, one, and then two. Um, because the two, I got two pounds, I got a discount, but all together it was about $45 for just the business. The beaker was about 40 bucks itself and the stainless steel tools also. So all together we were probably in 150 bucks. So, you know, I mean, these are not chemists. No, and, and, and we wisely decided to stay away from this project and let them do the empirical. Uh, so, it, it, I think it was a way to show what could have been done. I mean, Gene Downs was a professional metallographer. I think he was, and Phil Tucker was there. So these are guys who spent their career doing this kind of, of, of metallurgy properties and so forth. So they and they would probably have nice. You know, at the time, very good government equipment and control. This was, you know, we got this, we're going to try to make it. They were going to do it. And so yeah. they did. I think it, you know, it was a great opportunity to show 
this unusual behavior that had nothing to do with the process. I mean, when they processed pol bismuth to get polonium, they weren't interested in growing pretty crystals. They wanted to extract polonium out to get there, and they would do the solvent. But again, it's an interesting side in the fact that, uh, yeah. I got a question for you, Bob. If you drink too much Pepto-Bismol and run into some neutrons, does that create polonium? <laughs> <laughs> well, it might. I mean, it might. You know, I mean, if you get exposed, but uh, it's, I don't think it's all that efficient a process, luckily. Okay, any other questions? Well, not, uh, thank you for coming tonight.